In this video, I'm going to discuss some um, common periodic trends, uh, patterns that you might see in the periodic table. Um, so I've, I have our periodic table up here again on our screen. And looking at it, I want to distinguish between uh, nonmetals, um, metals, and something that kind of falls in between, um, call them, this is not quite the same matching color, metalloids. Um, so our, our metals are typically going to be on the left-hand side of the periodic table. And so they're gonna encompass most of the elements in our periodic table. Right here, I'm outlining them in yellow. Hopefully you can tell on your screen. It also includes the lanthanide and actinides that we kind of subset underneath the rest of the periodic table. So all of these elements are actual metals um, and they have different properties that we'll talk about here in a bit. Um, actually, we'll just do this now. Um, so our metals are gonna be really metallic um, in their luster. Uh, they can be malleable. Their hardness, though, varies. Um, it's kind of all over the place. But they will conduct heat and electricity at varying levels. And most of them are solids at room temperature. Mercury is the exception, and it's a liquid at room temperature. None of them are gases. Their chemical reactivity also varies greatly. Um, I mean, we're talking about a lot of elements here, and some of them are extremely reactive, and some of them are completely inert, it seems like. Um, and so those are our metals. Then we have our non-metal elements, and they're in this, the right-hand side of the periodic table for the most part, and it's much fewer elements. Um, and also, and this is the weird one, hydrogen. And hydrogen is placed over with the metals based on the charge it most commonly forms, which is plus one. And so it's very similar to lithium and sodium, and potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium in that way. Um, but there are plenty of people, and I have listened to some long arguments about the placement of hydrogen in the periodic table. A lot of people think that it should be right next to helium and above fluorine because it does form a negative one charge as well in a lot of certain situations. And it's a non-metal, and so it should be with the other non-metal elements in the periodic table. But, you know. So, um, these are fewer, and uh, they behave differently than metals. They're, they're not going to be malleable and, and pretty, uh, or shiny. I, I'm sorry, shiny doesn't necessarily mean, mean pretty, but it eh, kind of does. But they're brittle, and they're dull. Um, they don't really conduct electricity or heat. Um, their re reactivity, though, varies just like the metal reactivity does. Um, it's kind of all over the place. Um, and these ones usually don't exist as pure elements. They usually exist as compounds um, combined with other elements. Um, and many of these are gonna be gases um, at room temperature. Some are solids. Um, the only one that's liquid is bromine. Typically on periodic tables, they distinguish between the um, phase of the element at room temperature with different colors for the element symbol sometimes. So kind of the way to check is look at mercury and bromine. And if they're a different color than the other ones, then that's the color for the liquid phase. And then look at oxygen and fluorine, and those will be gases at room temperature no matter what. So whatever color those are is indicating the gases. All right, so then there is this other space that um, is right in between these two. And it's this staircase pattern, and these are our metalloids. Um, and they, they're in between the metals and the nonmetals, and they have properties from both of these groups. So they, um, their behavior is very different. Um, so they have kind of intermediary properties between them. So they might have a metallic shine, but be brittle. And they're semiconductors. So our nonmetals don't conduct, but our metals do. And our metalloids are semiconductors. And so they, um, they're, they're used in a lot of electronic parts. So silicon is kind of the, the main one that you think of in this regard as being a semiconductor. And so their properties are always going to kind of take from both categories. All right, let's look at another pattern. Main group, and we've alluded to this already, main group versus transition metals um, or transition elements. So our main groups are the A um, and our transitions are the Bs um, for our group numbering, um, which is the, the one I definitely do prefer. Um, and so it's gonna be our first two groups and our last six will make up our uh, main group elements. And these elements will all have valence shell electrons that change as you change the element. So as you add a proton, you add an electron to the valence shell. And we'll talk about that more when we talk about electronic structure. Um, 
and the transition elements, when you add extra protons and electrons, they add into the core electrons. And so you don't see a change in their valency. Um, yeah, so it's important to keep these. And the lanthanide and actinide series, which is usually here, is categorized within these transition elements here. And so that means when you're counting groups, you usually count uh, one, two, you skip these transition ones, you start three up with the main group again, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you have eight main groups. Some of our groups come with names and similar properties, others we don't really have named. But um, so within our main, our, our elements, um, our group 1A, so these ones right here, these are our alkali metals um, with the exception of hydrogen because it's not a metal. Um, next to it, we have our alkaline earth metals, which is this group 2A, um, and they have different properties within them. Um, then we have, uh, we don't have great names for the ones over here in the main group, but our 7A we call the halogens and 8A the noble gases. The uh, 3B through, well, these ones right here we call the transition metals. And then we have our lanthanide series and actinide series right here. And so Here's some, some info about these. And so the similarity in the groups, especially out of the main group elements, comes from the fact that they have the same number of valence electrons. Um, and so they behave very similarly when they interact with other elements. So our alkali metals, which are that group one, are going to be extremely reactive. Um, they always form a plus one charge when there's an imbalance between their electrons and protons. And these ones uh, react with oxygen um, to form things that'll still be able to dissolve in water. The very reactive piece of these is really with water, which is interesting. So things like sodium and potassium metal, when you throw them into water, they just give off this big burst of energy and explosion, and usually there's flames dancing on the surface of the water. It's fun. <laughs> now the alkali earth metals, so that second column, they're not as reactive. They don't explode in the same fun way. They always form plus two ions and, um, then when they react with oxygen, they actually form really strong bases, um, but they're not very water soluble. Then we have a big block of our transition metals. These have um, different charges um, associated with them. So each element can oftentimes form multiple different charges or what we call oxidation states. And we'll get into that chemistry, which is rich and fascinating um, in one of our later classes at the end of the year. Now, the lanthanide and actinides tend to form plus two and plus three charges, um, and the actinides within those are radioactive. Um, and so those are all of our metals, and our metals are all going to form positive charges. Now, our nonmetals are going to either be tied up in compounds or they're going to have negative charges typically. Um, so we have our halogen, which was our second to last column. They're very reactive, um, and they typically form diatomic molecules in the elemental state. Um, and there'll be negative one charges always. And they'll, they'll form salts with metals, typically. And then our noble gases, our last column, they're inert. So they're not ever going to be charged. Um, they are heavier, um, or the heavier ones are going to be able to have some reactivity to form compounds because they're so big. Uh, but typically, they don't form bonds, and they don't form ions, um, and they're monoatomic gases. <laughs> 